So, welcome back. And to those of you who are new, um, welcome. Um, where to start? Well, uh, we'll start with uh, the basic stuff. So what we're doing this year, this third season, is um, rather than me doing the talking, um, we're highlighting or, 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 yeah, highlighting alumni who were proud of and happy for and we'd like everybody to know about um, and let you hear from them. Uh, today is, is class of 86. Next time is class of 86. These guys are getting a lot of press, but that's okay. There are lots of different, there are six different um, programs. In the past, last year, we did a session in Boston with, which was titled A Priest, a Rabbi, and an Atheist at Talking About Why the Millennials Will Leave in the Church. And it was a success, so much so that we did an encore here in Cleveland, I think in June, maybe. Um, and the reason I mention that is because that's where I want to go with this first Thursday program. Away from me doing classes and, and more presenting alumni and, and what they're doing. And here's what's important for you guys, encouraging conversations. That's what these are. These are not presentations. These are conversations. There are people in the room who are going to be interested and knowledgeable about Terry versus Ohio for tonight, for instance. So when we started, the priest and the rabbi and the atheist got talking. The priest and the rabbi and the atheist did a few minute introduction of themselves. And for those, for, for the priest and the rabbi, they call it their spiritual journey. The atheist calls it teaching Bible at Hawking. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I think that, that what that did was, rather than me listing their, their many attributes and, and, and successes and stuff like that, um, I'd like you to hear from them. And, and uh, so I asked them if they would do that, and they said, sure, no sweat. So I'm going to turn it over to them now. Do we have any questions about nuts? And, oh, if you have to leave before, we usually go to 7.30, 6.30 to 7.30. If you have to leave beforehand, cool, just go ahead and go. Um, if you have to get up and, and, hi, Janie, if you have to get up and get something to eat or a glass of wine, do so. Um, we hope you'll come back. And at 7.30, I'll, I'll do a timeout. And if people need to leave then, or if people want to stay then, we'll just play it by ear. The bottom line is these are informal. These are conversations. These are not um, anything other than that. And it's a way to learn and a way to enjoy one another. So I hope you do. Welcome. This is Jan Margolis. Yes, yes. And this is Jeffrey Navicol. Dan's a lawyer, he's a cop. <laughs> and here they are. <laughs> so I'm Jeff Navarro, class of 86. Um, how did I get here? Goodness. Uh, so, Hawking 86, Worcester 1990, I got an internship with Progressive Insurance after I got out of school, and I was sitting there and I thought, uh, this is excruciatingly boring. Um, <laughs> I work for Progressive Insurance, I apologize. <laughs> uh, so I joined the Army. So I went to uh, Austin Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia, and I spent most of my career at uh, Fort Drum, New York, which is north of Syracuse, and one of the places that has worse winters than Cleveland. So um, <laughs> they gave me some perspective there, and then they trained us in winter warfare and how to melt with snow banks and do all that, and then they sent us to Somalia in 1993, 100 degrees every day. Um, <laughs> the and then in 94, they sent us to Haiti, um, where it's 90 degrees and 90% humidity every day. So I uh, did that for a while and then returned, and in 1998, um, I joined the Cleveland Heights Police Department. So I had to work for the uh, police department in the city I grew up in. So that was uh, pretty uh, pretty cool. And it's a pretty, it was a pretty interesting city to work in. I did get a little bit of everything from the, the border of East Cleveland, which is you know kind of a tough area, to the border with uh, Shaker Heights, where once I got called to go over and assist a woman whose car had been broken into, and she said, how long is it going to take you to fix the window? I'm not here to fix the window. And she said, well, why did I call you? <laughs> <laughs> so a little different, a different perspective. Um, in 2006, I left Cleveland Heights. I worked briefly for the Clinton Clinic Police Department, and then uh, the university, Case Western Reserve University, where they were in the police department. 
Um, and they were looking for some uh, supervisors, some experience to help them get that started. So a couple of officers from East Cleveland came over. I came down from Cleveland Heights. And uh, we started the campus police department here. And we've been here ever since. Um, we're going to talk a little bit. Oh, and then another highlight of my career was uh, a couple of years in my Cleveland Heights career. I was testifying in juvenile court. And they said, uh, you know, for the defense, Daniel Margolis. <laughs> <laughs> so he, got to, he got to cross-examine me. And he goes too hard on me. I've got some seventh grade players. We're not here. <laughs> Anyhow, that's one of the twists of my case, and then um, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, search and or stop and frisk and things like that, but hopefully we can get into some other things for this kind of boring topic for an entire hour, I think. Uh, we had the Republican National Convention here in July, um, and we had about 1,500 officers from various departments that were staying here at Case. That was one of my jobs, was to help get them all, you know, food fed and watered and down to where they were supposed to be. And uh, it was interesting because you get to talk to people from all over the country, but you also realize, you know, it's uh, our profession is under a great deal of stress now. It's mm -hmm. by everybody, you know, California Highway Patrolmen and Massachusetts State Troopers and everything in between. And, uh, you know, and policing is some, something that touches everyone to you know, some degree or another. Um, so hopefully we can uh, get into that as we get through the evening. So. My cross-examiner. <laughs> Jeff arrested my client, who I think was probably 15 or 16, and he was robbing a guy in the bathroom at Heights High uh, at the time. And it was, I think it was over a gambling debt, if I recall. And uh, I, I didn't really want the case to go to trial, because I knew, I mean, it wasn't a surprise that Jeff was a witness for the state, and I didn't want to have to cross-examine a friend. Um, but also, uh, in any setting, the last thing an attorney wants to do is cross-examine someone who is uh, honest and uh, incredibly smart. <laughs> and, and so I really had nowhere to go. Uh, <laughs> The whole thing was probably more unpleasant for me than it was for Jeff. Uh, my client was found delinquent or, or guilty, uh, and uh, Jeff bought the drinks a, a couple of nights later. Um, and I think I did disclose that I had known Jeff. Uh, I, I disclosed that on the record. Uh, so I started Hawk in, in kindergarten, I think it was 1973. Uh, a lot of people know me as Jim Margolis's brother, uh, so I'll just put that out there. Uh, I graduated from Hawken. Uh, Peter taught me how to write. I ended up at a small liberal arts college like Jeff in Minnesota, and I graduated, and I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I moved to Eugene, Oregon for a while, and thought that I might want to go to law school, but I wasn't sure. My dad, who's here, Dick Margolis, is an attorney. Uh, and he, he uh, does or he did, uh, at that time, transactional work, corporate work, mergers and acquisitions and initial public offerings. And I thought that that's what all lawyers did. Uh, and then I started working a couple years after I graduated at uh, a nonprofit called Cleveland Works, um, which... Uh, several Hawken alums, I believe, worked at. Uh, Grant Roth, who, who passed away, um, and, and, and several others. And it was there, Cleveland Works had a holistic approach to addressing uh, people on public assistance who have been on public assistance long term, and their belief was that you remove all the barriers towards employment, uh, which would be um, uh, warrants getting criminal histories expunged, uh, helping set up daycare, things like that. And the legal staff there was incredible. Um, and not only that, but they seemed to, uh, they, they, they were crazy. I mean, they were just hilarious. Uh, and uh, there was an attorney there named John Lawson, who is still a good friend of mine, who uh, is a brilliant attorney. And uh, so it was after leaving Cleveland Works that I decided to be, or at Cleveland Works, I decided to be an attorney, and I went to law school at the Vermont Law School, which uh, I'm proud to say it's the best law school in the state of Vermont. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then I came back to Cleveland right after graduation. I took the Ohio Bar, 
I got a job at the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office. I was there for three years doing appeals and arson and uh, juvenile stuff. And then, uh, and, pardon me? Yeah, yeah. Stephanie Tubbs Jones hired me. And then uh, my last year was uh, with Bill Mason. It was an entirely different. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. I, yeah. not, not in a good way. Oh. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, and uh, so then in 2000, after three years in the prosecutor's office, and it frequently works this way, I went into defense work, um, which was fairly easy to do. Um, being a prosecutor was somewhat less stressful um, because uh, because you had so much support, and I've essentially been a sole practitioner doing criminal defense and uh, education law uh, since then. So, uh, and I, I greatly enjoy it. Okay, so, um, so the Fourth Amendment protects against you know, unreasonable search and seizure, uh, one of the original Bill of Rights. Uh, you know, the founders wrote it because they were tired of British soldiers you know, coming to their houses and rummaging through their stuff. Writs of attainder. Yes, writs of attainder looking for, uh, I guess, you know, tax cheats or uh, you know, muskets hidden under the bed or whatever they were looking for. So, attainder? Writs of attainder. It was essentially a document that would allow uh, British soldiers to enter into colonial homes without. Um, without the strictures of probable cause mm. to search for whatever they wanted gotcha. to search for. So one of the things interesting is that actually two of the big, uh, biggest Fourth Amendment cases that had actually ever come through the Supreme Court both originated directly in the city of Cleveland. Um, so the original Bill of Rights was just, just federal, it didn't apply to the states. Uh, so and then you know, about the Civil War, they had you know, the abolition of slavery and slowly, and then 1961, there was Matt versus Ohio, which was the case in which they decided, the Supreme Court decided, that the Fourth Amendment did apply to the states, and Mack was a woman who was, uh, she was suspected of being part of a numbers running gang, which is sort of an underground lottery that existed back then, it probably doesn't really exist anymore. She was suspected to work for a guy named Don King, who was sort of a, <laughs> a, a, a criminal mastermind of, of the time, really went on to do you know, better hairdos and better things. So, <laughs> so the, uh, the Cleveland police went, and, went into her home, and you know, they found you know, tickets and money lying on the table and all these kind of things, and they gave a sheet, you know, thought that, uh, they needed a warrant to do that and went to the Supreme Court and that's when it was determined that yes, the Fourth Amendment applied, you know, not just federally, but uh, all over. And then in uh, 1963, um, there was a detective, I forget if it was McFadden, or yeah. Marty McFadden, yeah. So this is Detective Marty McFadden and the uh, fortunate gentleman at the bottom is Mr. Terry. Uh, Mr. McFadden, we had uh, an event here at Case a couple years ago um, where they had uh, some legal scholars who were celebrating the 45th anniversary of the decision or something like that. And uh, there were some Cleveland police officers there who remembered, remembered the detective and said he was one of the best at catching pickpockets in the city, which is why they always put him downtown. He was also a legendary drinker, so um, he managed to have quite a career. And he was uh, you know, in the area, the downtown area, and he observed these guys who were behaving in a suspicious manner. And one of the things he was down there to watch, which is also sort of a, a relic of an abandoned time, was there was, I think it was a Pan Am or a American Airlines uh, office down there. And back in 1963, I don't even know if credit cards existed. If they didn't, they weren't in wide use. So people tended to pay things for new things in cash. Uh, plane tickets were kind of a kind of a luxury item. Uh, you know, not many people could afford them as good now. So if you were a robber looking to stick someplace up, an airline ticket office was great. Just people went in there and they paid for cash and swapped their tickets, and that's where they had to go to get the tickets. So that was one of the things he'd been assigned to you know keep an eye on while he was patrolling. And he observed these guys walking up and down and doing all these suspicious things, and he decided that he was going to stop them. Turn it over to the lawyer. <laughs> so he, uh, McFadden, spun Terry around and patted him down and found, uh, found a pistol in his overcoat pocket. And, uh, I, you know, I think you read, uh, or some of you read, I'm not going to call out the people I know who didn't. Uh, <laughs> this is not the Socratic method, uh, which has its own joys. Uh, <laughs> But the case made it all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and the question was, you know, was this uh, within, well, were Terry's rights under the Fourth Amendment uh, violated? And 
the court came up with this kind of uh, ephemeris definition of when a police officer can uh, uh, approach a person on the street and search quickly for weapons. And it's reasonable suspicion, which is more, uh, more than a hunch, but less than probable cause. Um, and the definition is, uh, is, is almost impossible. And uh, so a lot of uh, Fourth Amendment litigation ends up being around uh, uh, stops on the street. Um, the best definition I could come up with, which is about uh, 100 words, is reasonable suspicion is a legal standard of proof that is less than probable cause uh, the legal standard for arrest and warrants, but more than an incohate and unparticularized suspicion or hunch. It must be based on speci uh, specific and articulable facts taken together with rational infer inferences from those facts. Um, and um, the frisk is allowed only for weapons. Um, and it's done uh, generally for officer safety. Uh, and it has expanded to, uh, in a traffic stop, officers can search the, uh, what is it called, the grabbable area of uh, a motor vehicle? Grabbable. Well, they say they think there's a gun that might be stuck, you know, beneath the seat. If there's a, you know, gun in the, you know, the glove compartment, you can't use it as a justification for telling somebody to open up the trunk or something like that. But you know, if you think that there's something that they, you know, they can reach, that there's a gun within reach, um, you know, are you going to pop the glove box? Are you going to, you know, Stick your hand in there and see. Um, make sure that there's not a, not a weapon within, or well, a weapon within reach. Right. A, a weapon in the trunk is not a threat to the officer's safety, um, and so the only real reason to do a Terry stop uh, is so that the officer can uh, encounter a, a, a person on the street and uh, feel raised, reasonably safe doing so. Um, a lot of cases come out of Cleveland. When I say cases, they don't go very far, but uh, officers during the uh, crack epidemic would say, and I recognized uh, the uh, plain feel of rocks of crack cocaine in the subject's pocket. And uh, as a prosecutor, I'd always say, well, what? What's, what do you mean? Of course. But defense attorneys would always roll their eyes because uh, a rock of crack cocaine is about that big, and there's no way, uh, unless uh, the person is wearing spandex, in which case you don't have to search them anyways, you can tell, <laughs> uh, that an officer could feel uh, uh, the plain feel exception of, of, of crack cocaine in somebody's pocket. Uh, one of my jobs in the prosecutor's office was to write search warrants. Um, and so I would spend at least one day a week, uh, officers would come in, they tell me what the probable cause, they felt the probable cause was, uh, uh, and it has to be that they believe that there is something nefarious going on at, at a particular location and that a particular person, generally speaking, not a particular person, but that whatever's going on there is illegal and there has to be probable causes to all of those elements. And so I would spend a great deal of time writing search warrants. If I thought that uh, an officer didn't have probable cause, we would say no, and we are empowered to do that. Uh, a quick story, they were looking for somebody to come in the day after Thanksgiving because uh, the office was technically open to write search warrants. And I said, yeah, absolutely, I'll be happy to do it because I knew it was an easy day. And, and also <laughs> I knew nobody would ever be able to find me because the main doors to the office were on the ninth floor and I was on the eighth floor. And uh, and so a Cleveland detective comes in. He was a fifth district detective, which is university, the, the area around here. And he said to me, and I was shocked when he came in. I was like, how'd you find me? <laughs> and I was reading a book, uh, which is why I took that day, because I wanted to read. And uh, I said, so what do you have? And he said, well, we have a controlled buy out of this house a month ago. And a controlled buy is when they take a snitch who is uh, always, almost always an addict and they give him buy money that they had already photocopied. They search him, uh, 
when I say him, because it's almost always, but not always um, a, a male, we were so, and we would always use gender neutral language in the search warrants um, because we didn't want to get anybody hurt or killed. And it could happen, it did happen. Not only once or twice that I'm aware of. Um, but, and so the person would go in, make a buy, usually they're wearing a microphone, but not always. And then they come out and, uh, uh, and then turn over the contraband uh, to the detective. And then the detective would, if he bought 20 bucks, the detective would give him 20 bucks and send him on his way until they needed him again. And he said, well, that was a month ago. I said, that was a month ago. He said, he said I need a buy within a week. And I, I said, have you done anything to freshen the probable cause? He says, yeah, we were doing surveillance yesterday. I said, and what did you see? And he said, we saw people uh, parking on the street, some going in for a short amount of time and leaving, and some going in for a longer amount of time and, uh, and then leaving. And I said, and that, in your training and experience, is uh, typical of uh, narcotics trafficking, correct? He said, yeah. And I said, let me be the devil's advocate here. Is that also not uh, typical of Thanksgiving? <laughs> he said, yeah. And I said, let me guess. And pardon me for using the language that I use. I said, you're down here because you're, and pardon me, because Jeff's a sergeant. I said, you're down here because your sergeant's a prick. <laughs> he said, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said, do you want me to talk to him? He said, sure. So I called him up, and the guy just starts yelling at me. And he said, uh, he said, we always get probable cause on this stuff. I said, no, you don't. And I said, if you have a complaint, you can talk to my boss, because I knew they were backing up. And, I, and then I said to the detective, I said, look, you call me at 3 in the morning with probable cause, I'll write the warrant. Uh, and, uh, but there was no way that my bosses would uh, – uh, be happy if I wrote that warrant because it, it stunk out loud. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of stuff that people who are really doing the work day in, day out um, are, are addressing. So if you fast forward a little bit to stop and frisk, so in the 1990s, uh, New York is having, you know, some serious problems with crime, and you know, Mary Giuliani and some other people uh, who are running the city, who want to do something about this crime. And uh, so stop and frisk became the tactic to, to do that. Um, so I used to work in the city of Cleveland Heights, which is somewhat notorious for pulling people over for traffic violations. Um, so you, can, uh, you, know, you got one in the late 90s, and you hopefully you've erased my face. <laughs> so but one, of the, one of the things, you know, and then one of the, you know, I, I wasn't always happy about what I was doing either, but one of the things that, you know, I'm very, you know, a couple months into my career, I pulled over a guy, and I mean, well, I don't have a license. What's your social security number? It's this. So I run on my little computer, comes back to a little old lady in Cincinnati. Okay. You know, <laughs> long story short, it turned out it was one from bank robbery in Michigan. Um, we arrested him, and then, you know, some Michigan state troopers are on the way down to come, you know, pick him up. And the only reason that uh, he wanted to go into, you know, getting caught for his friends was, you know, he turned right on red on Lee Road. So, uh -huh. and he's sitting behind him, so. Um, you know, so that's the, that's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, can come from some of this stuff. So for stop and frisk, you know, they were going to, you know, so one of the things, so we, you know, when you get a crime wave or something like that, whether it's in the city or campus or something like that, what's the first question? What are you guys doing? So, you know, do you want us to be reactive and, you know, sit and do nothing or do you want us to, you know, get out and do something? So the NYPD was giving instruction, go out and do something. Um, so they started doing large, I mean, obviously New York City's population is, you know, 10 times the size of Cleveland or something like that. So everything is you know, kind of up by an order of magnitude. But they started doing hundreds of thousands of these stops. Um, eventually, that got to be, and you know, they were pulling, you know, they were finding some guns and warrants and things like that. But you know, eventually, obviously, there was some litigation with that. And the question became, you know, you're doing 600,000 stops in 2011. Is that 600,000 cases of reasonable suspicion? I mean, that's a lot of people walking up and down the street in, in circles or something like that. Or are you just going after certain areas and targeting certain communities? So. The judge, you know, stop and frisk was not, and it is not, unconstitutional. That's not what the judge found, but they found that the way that it was being applied was targeting, you know, certain groups, specifically, you know, minority neighborhoods and minority use, um, you know, un unconstitutional. So the way the tool was being used was you know, deemed to be not, not correct. And as you saw in some of the articles, you know, if you read some of the articles, you know, great, if not, 
that's, that's okay. I didn't do my homework in Mr. Scott's class a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, so if it comes, you know, what 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 is the you know what is what is the you know, how effective is the tool is the other question. So people say that you know compared to the amount of stops you're doing, the amount of arrests and things you actually made with this, so is it worth the uh, the agitation you know you're causing in the community because you know stop and frisk can be kind of intrusive. I tell you to you know get up against the wall and run my you know my hands down your outer clothing. Um, you know, and I've I've got a gun and I've got a badge. You know, that's that's something that's going to you know make an impression on me. I mean, but you know, if I'm doing it all the time, I forget it. I guess all people walk up to me and say, "If you did this to me that one time, I, no, I don't remember." <laughs> you know, sorry, don't remember. But for me, I'm you know, I'm locked in their memory for you know, for all time. So uh, that's because it's just you know that's the way it works. Um, so is it worth you know the was it worth the you know the, the friction it was causing with the community and how how effective was it? Sort of, sort of the questions, and there are also you know, some of the legal questions. Maybe I uh, get at the, the legal heart of the matter there. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think you did. And part of the problem was is that there was damning evidence, which is that uh, one uh, officer who objected to the practice actually made a recording of his boss telling him to go out and just search uh, uh, African Americans and, and Hispanics. Uh, and he objected, and he says, "Look, that's what I'm telling you to do. You got to go out and do it." Um, so there was uh, there was uh, good evidence that it was being applied unconstitutionally, unfairly, and illegally. And so that's why that's why it ended in New York. I mean, New York. New York cops, New York, well, as, as a program, I believe it is. But New York cops are still doing stop and frisk. Yeah, yeah. That's why I suggested this. But they, I mean, it's still a tool that officers use. It's not like uh, New York officers cannot do a stop and frisk. Uh, they need to for their own safety uh, when there's an encounter on the street that meets the standards <laughs> laid out in Terry. They need a reasonable suspicion. The reasonable suspicion cannot be my boss told me to go do this today, um, and um, and that's what a lot of those uh, incidents were. And uh, so the, the judge, uh, who's a district court judge, a federal judge, put an end to the program. Mm -hmm. So what do you think Donald Trump means when he says I'm going to be the law and order president? We'll find out. Um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a pendulum. So we've had, you know, I, I told you, I talked to a lot of the 50 other officers we had here from, you know, from all over the country. And, um, you know, I, like many people, I'm so, somewhat nervous about what's about to come, but uh, a lot of police officers didn't feel like the Obama administration was, you know, especially supportive for, for police officers and chiming in on cases that are still, you know, undecided. Um, obviously there have been some, you know, some pretty, some pretty bad things going on, but they're also, you know, it's, one of the things, I guess, one of the things I would ask for a little sympathy for is, you know, police work is inherently messy. Right? It's always going to be messy. Inherently um, messy. Inherently messy. Um, I'll tell you a you know, story. So on Mayfield Road, you know, late one night, there was a guy who was high on something. He was in his underwear on a November evening, and he was screaming stuff at the people on the bus stop. So, you know, reasonable suspicion, probably the cause, probably. Um, so we, we go down there, and it took, uh, you know, it took five of us to get, get this guy under control. We had a guy who had one of the extendable batons, and he's kind of in the back of his knees to try to get his knees to buckle and bring him down. And so we, we arrested him, and then the people on the bus stop are yelling at you, 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 you know, a lot of the trend in policing for the past couple of years certainly has been you know, trying to do more community policing, trying to do more community outreach, get people to you know, get to know people. Because the community can be you know, your greatest asset. There's nothing better when you're you know, trying to chase them back to the backyards and everybody's saying, hey, go over there, go over there, go over there, as opposed to everybody you know, shutting the door and you get, get no information. But uh, then, you know, there does come a point when you know, criminals are not interested in community policing. They're not interested in becoming your friends. So you know, it has to, has to strike a balance there. But I hope we don't, you know, Get forced too too far into a corner the other way where you know you're going to get you know community backlash. Um, so those are my rambling thoughts there. What are examples of how you're becoming involved in the community? Well, um, so you know for municipal policing, I mean, certainly like Cleveland, Cleveland police, we never you know, they never did you know stop and frisk in the mass quantity that, that New York did. Um, when I was in, in Cleveland Heights, you know, a lot of the problem is. 
you're just you're just so if you hop in your car and you just want to call the call to call the call and it's in your ship when you go home. So there's no real opportunity to do any kind of you know, community outreach or anything like that because you're just too busy. So they're trying to so we get a specific way this is the officer, I'm gonna take this officer, I'm gonna pull him off the road, we're gonna have him go to school events, we're gonna have him go to you know community events, we're gonna hold forums where people can come in and you know and talk to us and you know it requires effort and time and resources. But uh, they were you know we're trying a lot of departments are trying to get out of the you know the nine one one you know mindset where we're doing is just responding to all these calls. So but again that requires time and resources. So, so the city of Cincinnati they had some, some terrible riots and some terrible problems a number of years ago. They went through the whole consent decree and things that the city of Cleveland is going through now. They put a lot of resources and things into you know, community policing. They got a lot of good feedback from various community members about that. But now, you know, A, they're starting to you know, run out of money for some of these programs. So how sustainable are they going to be? And B, um, you know, a lot of the same problems that, you know, in certain inner city parts of areas of Cincinnati, you know, the education system still sucks, the employment still sucks, and all these things that police officers don't really have control over. So now they're starting to see a little you know, creep, creep back to you know, where, where things were, the way things were before. So, that helps. If, if you stop and frisk and you don't find a gun, but you find $100,000 in a bunch of terror, <laughs> um, is that suppressible then? Well, I mean, what do you do? Do you well, it depends to on to what to brought the officer there. It depends on what the officer observed and what his, whether he was acting on a hunch or whether he was acting on reasonable suspicion or he even, you know, you saw a guy drop, a, you know, drop a, a, a little bag of heroin. So uh, it depends what, how the encounter started. So it's not finding the gun that, that makes it okay. It's the reason, it's the objective facts or whatever you want to call it that, that cause the reasonable suspicion to occur. Well, you're not allowed to search for, it's just for officer safety. Uh, so, uh, you know, generally speaking, nobody's buying it if you're saying you felt crack cocaine, okay? but. If somebody has a huge wad of bills in their pocket and you pull it out and it's $10,000 in cash or something like that, uh, and maybe the officer then uh, develops further uh, uh, a probable cause or even reasonable suspicion to do another search and pulls heroin out of the guy's uh, pants, uh, you know, the case progresses from there. So it's probable cause to go beyond the, the, the surface search. Okay. Generally speaking. Right? Yeah, I mean, that, you know, it's, and then there have been cases of, I forget there was a, a case somewhere in Southern Ohio where, you know, like a guy's wearing a huge puppy jacket. Okay, so what do I, I want to go when, you know, and it's the middle of winter, I want you know, he could have a gun under the big puppy jacket. So I don't want to go and pet down the puppy jacket, I want to go underneath the jacket and, you know, and find out, you know, if he had, if he had something. In that particular case, you know, they did, they did find a gun. I think. I think that was that was held to be okay, but you know it's it's every every case is different. Uh, depends on the, the, the yeah. lawyers and other things. I mean, uh, I was so I get called to a BP gas station one day. And he said, "There's a guy who's sitting there. He's you know he's arguing. He wanted the key to the bathroom. The tenant wouldn't give it to him, so he's arguing with him." So I get there. He's being kind of belligerent. You know, against the one to pat you down. And he's got a you know there's something something in his pocket that you know feels. You know, it could be a gun, and I'm not looking at the exact size, but I pulled it out. It was a sandwich bag full of a white powdery substance that I believe in my experience and training to be cocaine. Um, so then, you know, where do you go from there? And then you try to elbow me in the face. So, you know, probable cause after that. <laughs> yeah. he, knew that he was in some trouble. So, but it, it's, you know, it, it can be tricky. Um, police officers, you know, after a while, you kind of learn what, what to say, um, you know, what to, what, to, what to do. I mean, you know, I don't think uh, one of the things that Irritates me a little bit when I talk to other people about, you know, I've worked for a couple different departments, you know, I've been a police officer from different departments. Um, you know, I haven't run into you know, raging psychopaths. I don't want to go out and violate somebody's civil rights today. I want to go out and shoot some people, you know, today. I mean, there are people who are, uh, you know, trying, trying to do their jobs, but it's uh, a lot of times, you know, the law is gray. It's not, uh, it's not, not accounting. It's 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 not accounting. How about the concealed carry now that people can carry weapons? I mean, doesn't that sort of impact what this would allow? With the stop and frisk, I mean, if, if someone has their license, or I mean, if this is well, they're supposed to say at the beginning of the encounter if they have a permit that they're that they're armed, um, <clears throat> and not doing so can cause uh, it, it can 
you can be charged criminally uh, for that. You need to have a permit either from the state of Ohio or another state that Ohio recognizes to carry a concealed weapon. Do we recognize Texas? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Google it. Google it. Google it. Google it. Well, what's supposed to happen is you walk up to the car and you say, yeah, I'm going to pull you over speeding or speeding around. They say, okay, just so you know, I'm a you know, concealed carry permit holder and I have a gun you know, in, the, uh, in the dashboard. If I ask to see your, you know, your paperwork, you confirm that you know, you're supposed to be able to you know, show me your paperwork. Um, you know, concealed carry, now you're getting you know, guys who like to you know, have a 45 stuck in their belts and walk around you know, just to, to, to test the system. Um, Personally, I'm not a, not a big fan of that. I wasn't, you know, the assault weapons ban. I was happy when that was in place. This, you know, I mean, even if you're a, I, I own guns and you know, shoot guns, but I don't, uh, you don't need, you know, assault rifles are good for what? You can't hunt squirrels with them. Um, you can't, you know, they're only one purpose, and it's to, to kill people. So, um, yeah, so that's uh, the concealed carry. And then, you know, during the RNC, you know, we were talking before, you know, there were some people, there was a guy walking around with an you know, AK 47, you know, downtown, just to, you know, got, he was either he was a white nationalist, he got surrounded by black nationalists, or you know, vice versa. The system where everybody's armed, and they're all now you know, surrounding each other. And in that particular case, you know, nothing, you know, nothing bad happened. But it's just you know, like here on, you know, on, the, on the college campus, you know, people say, you know, you know, my son or daughter is a little scared, can they have mates when they have a taser? And they say, well, in the state of Ohio, you can have those things, but you're not allowed to have them in the residence halls. And they say, why not? And they say, because you know. College students, a few of them have been known to drink. Um, <laughs> and you know, you get these roommate disputes, and what if you know, you know, Dan and I and then I have you know, room, window open, window close. Yeah. So uh, you just, you know, it's, it's kind of a kind of a balancing act. I mean, so you know, and then now there's a proposal. You know, obviously everyone's aware of what happened in Ohio State earlier in the week. There's something called House Bill 48, which has passed the Ohio House, has not yet passed the Senate, nor you know, signed by the governor. But that would essentially allow campuses to decide whether or not they want to be. Um, you know, open open carry zones um, and it would knock the penalty. Right now, it's a felony. Right now, so the Case Western Campus is considered a protected zone. So even if you have a concealed carry permit, you cannot come on the campus with a weapon. Um, you know, we have like contractors so who are here to do plumbing. They have to come to our station, check in their weapon, go do their job, come back and get their weapon back when they're ready to leave. Um, if they don't, you know, it can be a felony. So even if after all this, Case Western says we're we're still a no you know no weapon zone, it would drop it down to a minor misdemeanor in terms of the crime. So we can sort of like, you know, Traffic ticket as opposed to felony arrest, which is a dramatic difference in terms of criminal charges. So we'll see. And you'd probably happens. be able to keep yeah. your permit. Probably, yeah. If you get a felony conviction, you might keep your permit. And felons cannot have permits. What What do you guys think? My wife, when we watch the evening news, Holly, almost every night says, "What we need in this country is more guns." <laughs> She's being sarcastic. All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but, but does it worry? Does it worry? <laughs> Does it worry you that such a proliferation of this gun, AK-47s and AR-15s are made to, for mass killings? What, what? I don't know. I don't understand it. Yeah, it, it scares. Uh, I guess it was. It scares the hell out of me. I mean, just <clears throat> the prolifer the proliferation of weapons uh, that are out there. Um, it's very easy for people to obtain weapons legally and illegally. Um, uh, you know, I can't tell you how many juveniles I've represented who, you know, were found to be in possession of a gun. Uh, they have no idea. They won't tell you where they got the gun. They, you know, the gun came from the gun bush. Um, and you can buy, and guns have changed. In the 70s and early 80s, the guns were Saturday night specials. They were small caliber, and they didn't always work. Um, now, um, what is it? it? It's High Point, I think. Uh, you can buy a brand new 9 millimeter for a little over $100. What? Yeah, and it's, the barrels are made out of pot metal, and they're not very accurate, but they fire. I mean, they're, they're reliable. Um, and so it's uh, it's scary, and you know, it, it, people don't realize that defense attorneys and police officers have we're, we're dealing with the same people, and it's not like they behave better for me all the time than they do, say, for Jeff. These are people who are not good uh, at accepting responsibility for their own 
failings. And so they tend to blame other people. Uh, frequently they'll blame the attorney, uh, police officer, um, and unfortunately, uh, threats are a part of my job and most of my uh, peers. And Jen will tell you uh, that a couple of times a year I will say, hey, uh, uh, I had to call Cleveland Heights. I live in Cleveland Heights. We live in Cleveland Heights. And we're having special attention on our house uh, because somebody has threatened me. And it happens to almost everybody in my profession. And so what that means is special attention means that my name is written in a book and then I never see anything. Uh, you know, I like to think that they're hiding in the neighbor's bushes. <laughs> but the reality is, is I don't think that, uh, I think that it's just to make me feel better. Uh, it, it could happen. Um, I mean, I'm not saying they don't check on the house, but. You just didn't see me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff did. Jeff has swung by uh, uh, when Jeff was with Cleveland Knights, He would swing by on occasion, and it was always uh, it was always fun. It's just like I put my spotlight in your room. Was he in Tammy's for the next six weeks? I guess I would just ask you know. So if you walked into a restaurant and you go out to eat, and you knew that everyone else in the restaurant was armed, uh, would that make you feel more safe or less? Safe? Some people would say it's worse, but would say less. There's a, oh, yeah. no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. This is to go back, back for a minute to the guy who was at Mayfield and Lee Road who was in his underwear in the mm -hmm. cold. Yeah. Hot, like what was wrong with him? And What's that, Lee? Yeah, I missed it. Hot, the, the gentleman, that, the person that they saw oh, right. at the bus stop who was causing a ruckus and he called and then he smacked in the back of his knees and then went down. Is he psychotic? How do you determine if somebody's, you know, drunk or, or sick? And how do you how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, so he had smoked something called wet, which is when you take a marijuana cigarette and you either dip it in embalming fluid or a roach spray. Okay. So, um, and it's kind of like uh, you know PCP or something like that. And the, the problem with people like that is you, you can break their arms and they'll feel terrible in the morning, but when you break their arm, that they don't feel it. I'm you know, you know, yeah. journal, but you know, I've also, you know, we've encountered people who uh, you know, are mentally ill. Um, so here's a story that maybe puts me in a less flattering light. You know, so I was, I was sent that there was a suspicious guy in a parking lot. He's, so I get there and then he's walking around in a circle and he, you know, he's going, mm -hmm, and he, he looks like there's something wrong. So I just walk around and go, hey buddy, what's going on? He looks at me and he just takes off running, boom, you know, right down the street. And he's like, well, I so I, you know, I chase him, I chase him, I chase him, and I'm chasing him, and I'm getting more and more agitated as I have to chase him. I'm getting hotter and sweatier, and all this kind of stuff. And I finally, you know, I'm about to catch up to him, and I'm about to let him have it. Uh, and somebody comes running out of you know, a door and somewhere in the neighborhood and goes, wait, wait, he's autistic. Oh. You know? So if they hadn't done that, he would have been face down on the grass about five seconds later. Like, so, you know, you know, how am I supposed to do that? A suspicious guy, he's behaving suspiciously, I'm just full uniform, he doesn't get down, you know. But, you know, the guy, the, the, the guy, uh, so when feel the he could have been, you know, but he wasn't. He was, he was hot. He thought it was you know, mine or something. So you, kind of, you just have to go off the behavior that's presented. And, and you know, one of the things I told my wife after a couple of years of working through the night is that two things I've realized there are way more crazy people out there than you think, and I never want to be the landlord of anything. It's not, you know, and police officers, we're, we're the, you know, you call us, we're coming, which is not the true for a lot of government agencies. You know, so we, we tend to get. Stuff where they're, I'm supposed to you know, solve people's family problems and go back 30 years and do all this kind of stuff. And it's uh, you know because because we you know we get to deal with everything. Um, it's uh, it's interesting. I have a question. Like let's say that resources right weren't an issue, which I know they always are. But let's still just say that there were plenty of resources. What would you wish for in terms of community based like What would you wish for a community relationship to look like? It's not the same. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's time, you know, it's just, you know, you, you have to, you know, pull somebody out, you, know, you can, you can reach out, you can try and hold meetings. One of the things on Cleveland Heights, one of the things we had the foot patrol officers who walked, walked the business districts. And they're one of the, but how did they end up there? Uh, because they weren't much driving. Yeah, it was <laughs> punishing. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, it was, but it was great. It was, it was, it was great. Um, you know, it's, I, I guess, uh, I, I did that. Um, 
voluntarily. For, <laughs> <laughs> but you get, you know, just walking up and down the street, I mean, it may, you know, it may seem very boring, but okay, you know, you can't. So you're, you're going to go into stores, you're going to talk to people, people are going to ask you for directions, people are going to you know, ask you know, to take their car when they park. And you just, you, know, you start to, to meet people in a way where you're in your car where you're just going to, you know, boom, 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 that you just don't, don't get to do. So I would like to see, you know, the Cleveland had the, the mini stations for a little while, mm -hmm. which were essentially abandoned you know, because of, of funding issues. And those were. You know, just, it's it's about having the you know the time to, to stop and talk to people, you know, before they're calling for help or before you know because by the time you call me because you're having a problem, you know, it's, it's kind of already too late. You know, with my, my full armor when I you know I come to see what's going on. Um, but that's what I mean. if you had had the funding, you know, just getting a couple officers, getting school resource officers, um, getting you know, people who have got the time to dedicate to community meetings and to try and figure out if the community has other ways that they like to get you involved. Uh, you know, the Cleveland Clinic uh, for a number of years put on a fair, a community fair, where we just had cruisers, you know, open and they had coloring books in them and kids can come in and, you know, hit the sirens and run around the cars and stuff like that. It's a good, good thing, but uh, you know, I think they might discontinue that as well. So, uh, yeah. I'm just wondering from the perspective of an officer, because um, I don't know the consequences. Is an officer likely to feel very inhibited? He's inclined to want to do a stop and frisk. I mean, does he have to think hard about that, or can he just kind of go with it? I mean, where, where are, are you? Consequences mm -hmm. um, damaging if you do a stop and frisk when someone says you, that you have offended someone's rights. Well, yeah, I mean, you don't, you know, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where, you know, someone like Dan is going to be, you know, crawling up your, your back. <laughs> you know, a little later, you don't want to. Get cases, you know, thrown out. I mean, you, you know, you want to try and, and, and do the right thing. I know, uh, you know, in the area of the, of the cell phone camera and all, the, all this kind of stuff now, and you know, everyone's uh, much more, more conscious of what they're doing. But um, you know, if you, if you think you're you think you're right, you, know, you can't you can't be afraid either. Because right. um, if you do that, then they thought this was appropriate. You want them to do it. And to be, you know, um, you know, if you're in a situation. I would rather do something that I think is, you know, maybe going to preserve my own life, and then we'll look in and we'll deal with it a couple weeks down the road. Um, so, you know, I tend to lean more towards the side of doing something than not. So, but it is, it is, a, you know, it is a thought. I mean, I started as a policeman in '98, and now it's, you know, uh, 2016, and it's it's a you know, great deal in a relatively short period of time. And and most defense attorneys realize I I don't sue, I don't sue police officers, I don't sue police departments. It's not what I do. Um, most of us realize that police have a very difficult job to do and that as Jeff uh, explained policing is not always going to be pretty and it's not always going to be sanitary um, and uh, and it's a tough culture especially in the Cleveland Police Department because the guys on the street oftentimes don't have the support of their bosses. Um, there's a rumor that a very popular commander of one of the districts in Cleveland was either stepped down or was removed because he wasn't uh, he wasn't jackpotting enough of his officers. Um, uh, internal stuff. Uh, getting them in trouble. Oh. A jackpot is a bad thing. Oh. It's not a good thing. Uh, and um, and so, uh, it, it's, it's a tough culture. Police are forced to make split second decisions that have great impact. And, um, and, and frankly, uh, if you do this long enough, you learn, even as a prosecutor, I knew that there are police officers who, where their word was, was gold, it, you know? Good or bad, they're going to tell you what happened. And then there were guys uh, who weren't so good. I mean, there was one guy, a detective that we dealt with, whose nickname was Flashlight. And the reason his nickname was Flashlight is because he used to beat the crap out of people with his flashlight. Um, and so you, you try to stay away uh, from uh, that part of the work because uh, like when they would come in to me uh, to write a search warrant and a guy had a bad reputation, uh, I, would always, uh, I would always have questions about the information 
that they were providing. I'm, I'm proud of the police culture that we have in this country because one of the things I've learned since working at Case Western, which now is a very large international student population, a great many of whom are Chinese. You know, the first time I walked up to a you know Chinese kid uniform when we talked about something, he was just, you know, I mean, he was you know, yes sir, no sir, well, I mean, he was he was terrified. And I was just trying to ask him, and they come from a very different culture um, and you, you know. have to be very very sensitive to sure. that at case don't you yeah and uh but you, know, you don't want them that and i hadn't done anything to, you know, terrify them you know, yet so <laughs> <laughs> but then you, you learn stuff like so you know, when you pull people over here you stay in your car the officer comes after you're doing in china apparently if you get pulled over you're supposed to gather all your documentation go over to the officer and present you know all your documentation to him to explain you know why it is that you are allowed to drive and do all this kind of stuff so it's just a very you know different culture, and you know, I'm glad, glad we're not that way. You know, be a lot more yeah. still. Are you going to continue your career in police? Because with your writing abilities, courtesy of Peter, I was reading some of your um, entries. You know, handoff, rounding third, that you write for the school newspaper. They're great. Oh, thank you. You could just screenplays. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it helps me feed my three children. One of the older guys said when I first started, he said, you're never going to get rich, you know, but you're never going to starve. You know, this, is, this is a good job. So, so okay. But uh, yeah, though, so talking about community policing, I, I had the opportunity to write, uh, there's something called The Observer, which is the student newspaper at Case Western. I wrote a, a column for a couple of years, years for that. You know, it's in one of the ways of trying to reach out to them. Student, uh, student community. That's great. Right. They yeah. really are witty and very relevant to their age. Yeah, you have to be humorous. So they're, you know, if you lecture, college students are used to. I was curious what you, I can't remember what it's called in Shaker Heights, but we have like a community base, like people in the community can be trained and ride mm -hmm. along with. Oh, a Citizens yeah. Police Academy. Yeah, what do you, what's that about and what do you think of it? Is it worthwhile or? It's it's great in that you get you know to know the officers and the officers get to know you. Um, we've got something similar case. It's called the CERT program where people are trained and all that kind of stuff. But you know, not going to get to do much real because we don't want you to get hurt. You know? right. So yeah. So I mean, if you want to just kind of learn what you know what the job is, what they do. Um, you know, one of my uh, left people have written about police work. One of my favorite authors is a guy named Joseph Wamba. He, wrote, uh, he was a you know, wrote a number and he wrote uh, the New Centurion, which is one of my favorite police books about. What it was actually like, it's about a you know, series of cadets, you know, a group of friends that are fictional <coughs> through the Los Angeles Police Department from the academy through the 60s and 70s and all the things go through. And what his saying was that the police work is, you know, hours of boredom punctured by terrorists. And so <laughs> that was a good, uh, good, good way to go through it. Yeah, but if you want to know more about, you know, what it is, that, that, you know, that, that can be very good. So it doesn't necessarily help in terms of community. I mean, if, if you know, you can be vigilant and you know, learn to call things and things that look suspicious and stuff like that. You know, that can be great. I'm not going to give you a sniper rifle. Okay. Um, <laughs> we, I've been sold when they have these mm -hmm. people that you know wear uniforms, and then they would come like to the baseball diamonds when the kids are playing soccer or a little league, mm -hmm. and just to have them there and see a uniform, I think, lends to you know safety and. and now, when Shaker, a friend of mine did that, and you were I was the policeman at night, and they, they teach you point out, you know, where there could be trouble. It's interesting if you want to do that. I don't know what I want to do. That. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard, and it takes a long time to get into the I don't want people that are not experienced riding the car, because then you have to check them too, I think. You so, don't drive the car, you sit in the car. Just have it there. It's not 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 there. I always found it kind of annoying because now there's other people that I had to keep in, you know, when we're getting into something and, you know, they want to get out of the stay in the car. Yeah, get in my way. So, but hopefully they learn something, but they're all, oh, can I do anything? No, don't touch me. Yeah. So, um, case you said is a protective zone. Uh, yeah, for for weapons, yeah. Um, can businesses, you know, can businesses do that? You know, today in the paper they had that some guy went into a Levi's Strauss store with a gun and ended up shooting himself. Mm -hmm. um, and so this the chairman of Levi came out and said, you know. 
don't bring guns into the store. But at the end of it, he kind of said, it, this is not, this is a request, not a mandate. And so I was kind of wondering, why doesn't he just make it a mandate? Is, is a business, is a for-profit business not allowed to make a mandate where his case can do it because they're at school? Or? Well, I think private businesses can declare they can yeah. decide who comes in. And they can put a, a, a sticker, you know, that's essentially designed by the state of Ohio that says you can't bring weapons in here. So he just, he just made a, a personal call that he wanted to make it a request and not a Yeah, statement. but it's, it, it's, state, it's state by state. Oh, well, yeah. So maybe that's the problem because they're... They're, they're yeah, national chain. Yeah, but in, in Ohio, if, it, you know, if you are a private business owner and you decide you don't want guns in your store, you can. You can. Okay. Is there a question over here? I, uh, so we live near Case, and we really appreciate uh, Case Police Department. So we live right across on East 118th Street. We feel like we live on Case campus. Like everyone we meet at the Case Department is. is, is we would want as our police person. Um, so, uh, but on the other hand, I, I do get nervous. <laughs> outside of the case, I'm not sure I'm, I'm as comfortable with the police. I'm, I don't have confidence that I'm going to be treated fairly. In fact, I worry if I ever get stopped, um, is, a, is the police person you know, going to treat me fairly or go crazy? or so I, it's a sort of a balance. I don't, I don't, they make me nervous. Yeah, uh, it depends, depends where you are. So one of the things, you know, that we, uh, it's a whole other, other topic is, you know, we're here, we're a university police department, which, you know, we're allowed under state law and we've you know, certified with police and that kind of stuff. I have a friend um, who you know, works in cases from Ireland. You know, in Ireland, they have, they have the guard, they have the national police force, and they do everything. He's like, you guys have you know, railroad police and transit police and university police, and they're all, you know, what are all these you know, people with badges and guns running around? Why is this this way? And he finds it you know, very baffling. And one of the things, to your point, I mean, one of the big, I think, crises that's coming, you know, we've already seen it with some of the things that happened in Cleveland, uh, recruitment is going to be a bigger and bigger problem for law enforcement going forward. Because, you know, I just, uh, you know, the Cleveland Heights Police Department, the last time they even tested, used to be, you know, you had you cut it off 200 applications and you know, I took the South Euclid test in 1998. You know, 200 of us, the chief walks in and said, Yeah, we're hiring one guy this year, maybe one guy next year. Somebody retires. So we can do a lot of 200. Great. But now, the number of people that are taking the test is less and less because it's, for whatever reason, maybe it's you know, those dark millennials, it's not as attractive as a profession. And given all the publicity it, you know, it's received, maybe you can understand that, but that has a you know, a boomerang effect too. And then, you know, you want people to be, you know, you want the, the best and the brightest, but you're making it less appealing to the best and the brightest. You know, the guy who you know, was involved in the Tamir Rice shooting, you know, washed out of independence. He washed out of his independence, you know, yeah. kicked him loose, and then he gets hired in Cleveland, and he's probably a little more desperate for bodies than some other departments are. You know. So I think that I personally think it's only going to get worse. There's certain things that, I mean, I always advise my clients to, but there's certain things that people can do when they encounter the police uh, to <clears throat> de escalate the tension. Uh, if I get pulled over, um, uh, you know, I pull over as quickly as I can. I put on my hazards. Uh, I keep my hands on top of the steering wheel. Um, and uh, doing things like that tends to, um, <clears throat> uh, it tends to de-escalate the situation. It makes it clear that at that immediate time, I'm not a threat. Um, I have a really dumbass look on my face on my driver's license. Uh, it's kind of a goofy smile. Uh, no. Yeah, I don't know if that helps or not, yeah. but it amuses me. Um, but and it, it doesn't always work, but being polite and respectful um, and compliant if you encounter an officer is generally going to work better than being a jerk. Um, officers have a lot of discretion. And, um, and you can either spend a night in jail if things go sideways or longer, or, you know, they can uh, bid you a good day and, uh, you know, and, and that's the end of it. So oftentimes it is, the, uh, it, it is the individual's demeanor when they encounter the police. And if, if, if the person is argumentative uh, or difficult, or defiant, 
uh, the encounter is going to become much more difficult and you're a lot more likely to get charged, even if you're not doing anything wrong at that is moment. what you're saying being taught in school? I mean, obviously, these are the kids know that. Cleveland does have a program where they actually have a little flyer from the police department where it says, you know, what to do if you're stopped by the police. I do some of the guy, but you know, another defense lawyer I knew the best advice he ever gave is so don't try and legislate your case on the side of the yeah. You're never gonna win. Yeah, you're not gonna win. If you feel you're, you're being mistreated, I mean if you ask for my badge number, I have to give it to you. I have to give you my name, you have to, you know, I have to provide all that stuff so you can record all that for a later date. But I'm talking about uh, Yeah, um so efforts are, are being made, but how effective they are you know, tough tough stuff. You know, we're trying to tell that to you know, some of the college students here. And they'll say, well, I, you know, I can do whatever I want. It's, it's, you, know, you can, but you know, if, you want to, if I tell you that a shark infested water isn't your swimming, don't you? Know, you're free to do that, but then don't complain to me when you get bitten by a shark. Um, I have a question about the use of video cameras um, and how it's changed. It seems to me it's he's under arrest. There, I'm sure you did video. Um, I'm sure that you sort of looked at his videos and you can make, it seems to me, Instantly, it's up on the national news. Everything's video. It must. It's made a huge difference in threatening you and sort of something that you can use on your end. And I just, you know, want to sort of a little bit knowledge more about it. You obviously had video cameras too. I mean, it's a two-edged, it's double-edged sword. Yeah. Now, we don't have them just yet at, at case because we don't have that volume of calls. But I mean, what you know, whenever, what if I followed you around for eight hours of work and I just filmed whatever you were doing? I'm not. And it, it certainly cuts down on the amount of, you know, you, know, you were talking about community policing, you know people, I mean, it, if you know you're being filmed, it changes the way you act. I mean, so at one point, you know, the television camera now, we start doing, you know, we would all, you know, kind of act slightly differently than we might otherwise. So, we're being filmed right now. But. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, but there are also cases where, you know, you go to the defense attorney and say, here's a video of your clients yeah. you know, doing X, Y, and Z. Well, it's not going too far. Yeah, it, it facilitates. There's a Cleveland officer named uh, James Simone, who's uh, pretty well known, but he had his own, uh, his own car, he had his own cruiser, he's the only Cleveland cop who did that. And he had the cage wired for sound, and he had a dash cam, and there were warnings. Uh, he had stickers that says, you may be recorded. And if he did a stop, and it was two guys, uh, and he thought maybe they had a gun and they ditched it, uh, he, Simone would put them both in the back of his car and he'd say, I don't want you guys talking to each other. Just keep your mouth shut. Okay. I'm recording you. And then he'd shut the door and he'd walk away for 10 minutes. And, you know, and then the defense attorney would get the video and say, what you do with the gun? <laughs> but, you know, it's in the trunk or something like that. So, as Jeff said, and that was... Simone wasn't doing anything wrong. He was just being smart. I mean, he warned him that they were being recorded. There were stickers in the case. There were notifications, and he told him not to talk. Uh, so, you know, when I'm looking at something like that, uh, I'm like, yeah, what's, you know, how can we resolve this today? You know, what's the best I can do for my client? And, uh, but, you know, the problem with body cams is, is that you're finding times when body cams just, they're not as decisive and clear as everybody hopes that they would be. And so you still have a lot of uh, gray area and, and tussling about what the facts are. They're not, they don't always provide an objective uh, perspective, unfortunately. So I have a question on like a very different topic. So if you're not done, then I wanna take you off it. But um, with this whole Standing Rock thing and the, you know, to access pipeline there have been so many claims i've claims i've heard like you know native americans are the most targeted racial and ethnic group in the u.s you know they're killed or shot or arrested more than any other ethnic group and so i've looked into this and i really haven't been able to find any statistics and so it kind of came onto my radar that there aren't really statistics taken and kind of like kept or shown for public people to see about you know like police shooting or killing people. And I don't know if that's, if that is public record somewhere and I just don't know where it is or. Policing is very decentralized. 
from every state kind of does its own thing. Okay. Um, I got certified in Ohio. If I want to go to Indiana, I probably have to go to the police academy again and take it and learn the whole. We've got the Ohio Revised Code, and you know, has something different. Some states, you know, like when Cleveland laid out a bunch of officers in 2004, I think it was a lot of them went south because uh, their the hours Ohio requires are more than what Georgia requires, but there are other places like California that are higher than them, so you can't can't work there. And it's you know the FBI has tried over the years to try and gather the statistics, but there there probably isn't the, the database that has everything that you're looking for, just you know wrapped and tied in a neat bow because it's been you know, the history of policing and it's every it's very state state driven, it's very locality driven, and uh, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, there's some frustrating people talking about police shootings and where's the data and all that kind of stuff. And in some cases, it's not being hidden. It's just not there. So that's my question. I guess I don't understand why the claims are being made if they can't really be substantiated by, like, you know, evidence. So that happens it's, all it's the time. It's frustrating. You know, and I just, I wonder yeah. if would those, yeah. if those statistics were taken, do you think that that would hurt the police profession? Or do you, like, do you think that it would change public opinion? Or do you think that public opinion would be... Kind of maintained. Um, I just I know it's very general, like wide question. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, I think you know, I mean, the vast majority of police encounters do not result in you know shootings. Um, so you, know, then you have to take the numbers in context and say, four hundred people got you know shot by the police last year. You can say that's horrible, but you know, that's a country of three hundred and twenty million people or something. So, um, but you know, every but you know, there have been some you know, especially you know, heinous cases that come out to more pieces in the system. You know, in America, it's a small percentage. So. Time's up. It doesn't mean you have to go away. It doesn't mean you have to stop talking, but, that, but it does mean that now's a good time to go get something to eat and get something to drink. These guys, whatever they want to do. Um, but I just want to finish it up by saying I'm, I'm so damn proud of these guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thanks, folks. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>